Welcome. Um, I'm going to give you all a new syllabus because I've added a, a few things to it. Um, and uh, so it's just updated uh, more than anything else. And uh, with us that wasn't here last week is Dr. Brom. I don't know how many of you know uh, Dr. Roy Brom, a, a vet vet, vet squared. He is a veterinarian by profession and a, a veteran, a veteran of the Vietnam War where he served as a veterinarian. So uh, lots of good, lots of good, uh, good, I don't want to say stories, but good accounts from from Dr. Brom so enjoy getting to know him here you go Rachel do you have a book yet no we haven't. that's new all right thanks let me then let me just tell you what's new on the schedule there there in the back of the book there's some some things he calls them notes a b c d e and f most of them revolve around the pentateuch and the beginning uh, chapters and uh, do you need a book? Yeah. yeah you do. Uh, and uh, and so I've kind of spread loaded them. Uh, they're not in exact order. I tried to get them as close to the order of the lecture that we're talking about, and at the same time, not. I mean, they're really short. You're going to find them um, easy, easy to read. So, so note that um, you know uh, the the note A. Uh, was actually historically come on in. Good to see you. Um, you need a syllabus, right? Yep, you do. And how many books? Two. Two. Okay, there you go. All right. So let's. Um, so read those. Read those notes along with the other stuff. That, uh, that you're reading. Um, I'll make a few comments about the reading in just a moment. Uh, the first thing I'd like to do is to, there it is, let's go through and, and what we'll do when we do uh, attendance is we'll, we'll mark, you know, your, your presence uh, and, I'm, and then I'll, I'll also ask if you've completed the reading that's assigned for today um, and so that'll help me keep keep up to speed, hopefully help you keep on track. So today uh, you should have read, uh, don't, the notes I know you just got now, but you should have read through chapter three. Uh, and so I'm just gonna go down the list and we'll add people as we need to, but, but Michael, are, um, are you up to, up to speed? Yes. Um, Ann, are you? Yes. And uh, Steve, yes. Maxwell, and Terry? Yes. Uh, Michael? Mostly. <laughs> you know, rare, rarely have I ever heard anybody say just no. It's almost, kind of, you know, almost there, but uh, that's all right. Okay. Uh, it, where's Josh, Rachel? Is he, is he coming? Yes, he's just got work now. Okay, so he's on his way. Um, Rachel, how about you? Are you up to speed on your reading? Mostly, I <laughs> okay. So, so what I'll do is, is next week, you know, I won't, mark, I won't mark it until it's actually done. But, but next week I'll, I'll, I'll ask you, you know, where you are and assuming you've kind of got caught up, then I'll, I'll mark them both. That's kind of how I do it. Um, Adelaide? Yes, sir. And you've done all your reading? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, Jim Needham? What was that? I'm done reading. You're done, yeah. Debbie? Yes, I just finished. That's why you were <laughs> uh, Chase, you're up to speed. Josh Smith? Yes. Uh, Evan? Yes. Val is out of town. Uh, Brad and, uh, and Brad? No? Trevor. Trevor. All right. Is it, I'm still looking at names. Is it Brad? Chase. Chase. That's right. I knew you were Chase. So I guess we're missing a Brad. I can't, okay. So, all right, so Brad and Amy are, are not here. Trevor, 
Uh, and are, are you up to speed on your... Yeah, and Paige? This is a you, first no, but I will be a yes next time. I got my wisdom, excuse, I got my wisdom pulled full today. I didn't think I'd be here. Did you really? So I was going to do my reading tonight. Anyways, I, I, here we are. Yeah. Are you sure you're here? You're off all the anesthetic? <laughs> Okay, um, Okay. very good. So, Chase and Leah. Samuel. Samuel. Yeah, it's you got the, you have the Leah. <laughs> and what, what was, Samantha, right? Samantha, yeah, I, I should, I, I, I think I told you I have a Samantha granddaughter. And What's the last name, Chase? O D L E uh, and Samantha. You know the crazy thing, and some of you may may know my my. Um, I mean, I could I could I could look at you and tell you you're from South Dakota. You moved down here just recently. Um, let me see. What did you What did you come down? Are you on Fort Leavenworth working? No. What was the What was Air Guard? Air Guard. Um, but the name the name does not stick. So you have a syllabus. Uh, and you have a book, yep. and I have one more book left. Does anybody want it? I mean, we want to, and we will keep it for somebody else. I guess, I guess we actually need it for the um, the Smiths, um, assuming that uh, that they are going to continue on with us. So uh, let me give you some um, some stuff about the book, kind of still preliminary stuff. Uh, I've. Um, you know, I, I mentioned to you that I, I was started with a different book, and, and I've, 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 we're not going to do that one. I mentioned that to you last week. So um, this is the first time I've read this book. I perused it, um, so I kind of knew what it was. And, um, and I'm, very, I'm very happy with it. Uh, it, it it's really, uh, let, let me just, it is not a technical book. The other one was more technical, um, and so that's, that's good. Um, it's, it's theology is, is, is very sound and it doesn't necessarily kind of peruse through all the bad theology that more technical books typically do. Those other two books I had were kind of going to peruse through the good and the bad and they usually come down on the side of good, but, but you got to kind of work through some of those things. Uh, and so you're not going to get that in this book. You're just going to get just snippets. Matter of fact, in one of those notes, one of the notes was the authorship, mosaic authorship of the Pentateuch, and he's going to do in about a page and a half, which those other th books would have done in about three chapters. Um, and so you're not really going to understand the full argument, but you're going to actually, you, but you will understand what they are arguing about. Okay. Um, all that to say, or at least not all that to say. Um, it is it is good. The, the charts the charts that I've, I've I've seen so far are well done. I think good information, good visual information. This is what I would I would recommend that you do. It's easy reading. Nobody should have struggled at all in the reading. It's it's easy reading. It's relatively short reading, um, um, uh, and and I I I think because of that. Um, it would, I think you would be well served, just read it twice. Um, you'll, you'll, get, you'll get something out of it the second time you get, you didn't get out of the first time. It's not much to read. I, I suspect anybody spent more than 20 minutes or, or so reading, well, you had double this time to read because we read, but, but one chapter is typically what we have. I would read it twice um, because uh, in <laughs> Because it is so condensed, and they and they have kind of taken out some of the some of the the the, the dialogue, if you if you would have, but he just he's just not not troubling you with that. Um, but didactically, when you think about learning and grasping, um, there is there is an aspect of learning when it's hard reading. <laughs> and you have to stop and think about it, you tend to stop and think and read it twice and wait a minute, what was that? You go back. And, and so a, a hard to read textbook is usually something you're going to learn more from than an easy to read one. 
Um, it, you just are. You're going to think harder at it. Um, that's, that's the advantage of it. The disadvantage is it's going to take you a long time to do it. Um, so all that to say, um, I think you can make up for that with this kind of, um, uh, this, this particular book um, by, by reading it twice. And I, I, I just think that will, that will be a good, um, a good way to mediate uh, that issue. Anybody have any questions or comments about, about any of that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he made the comment like he thought it was, um, maybe it's not on page 34, but... Yeah, I remember what you were talking yeah. about. Mm -hmm. And I was just curious what your thoughts on that. Yeah. I think so far, and I have not come, I don't remember coming across anything in his notes that I, that I thought he was, he was off base on, including that particular comment. Um, he is, his comment was the angels were, were probably created in, in, in Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That was everything. Um, angels too. And then, and then day one, he begins forming things. So, so functionally speaking, angels created on day one um, because the, the text implies that before that, there was nothing. It, that was the beginning of all creation. Yeah. Before that point, there was God. I guess where my question was, was essentially like Satan and the angels and all that. Like, what do you think that went on with him? Yeah, yeah. Here, and, and so, and so we'll, we'll do this because and, 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 I think this is interesting. Um, and so we can... Well, uh, we'll, 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 we'll dialogue on that because I, I think it's a good point. Um, Satan created day one. Hey, Josh. Uh, Satan created day one along with all the angelic beings. Adam not created until um, six, day six. Uh, and, and, uh, and then we get into chapter three of Genesis, which is the fall. And at the end of chapter... One, um, or, is it, or is it the end of the first part of chapter two? At the end of creation, and it says, you know, God created it and it was good. God created it and it was good. God created it and good. And he created all things and, and it was very good, is the summation statement at the end of creation. Uh, let's, let's look at that. That's in Genesis, Genesis 1. I think it's in 1... Uh, 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 yeah, end of one, 31. And God saw that all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. Uh, you should assume that that very good means that at that particular time, the world was still in the state of sublime perfection. In other words, Satan had not fallen yet. Right? The fall of Satan comes after Genesis 1.31. Um, and we know that it comes before Genesis 3.1, because in Genesis 3.1, he's already the fallen serpent who's going to, to, uh, to, um, to deceive Adam and Eve. So sometime between the end of chapter 1 and the beginning of chapter 3, he falls. Any guesses how much time that might have been? And it's only a guess because we're not told. Any guesses how much time that might have been? You think it was a short time or a long time? Long time. Long time? Why? I would assume several hundred years because Adam had been working and cultivating and naming all the animals for that time. And that would okay. have been a long time just to name all the animals. That's a, that, that, that's a good observation, good thought, that it might, might have been a long time. Anybody have any other ideas or thoughts? Good to see you. I think it takes a little time for perfect being, but a good sign. I mean, his, his credit is a perfect. You, see, you think it takes some time for that to happen? Yeah, you just start to wake up. Yeah. We, we don't know. My, my suspicion is 
that it was a very short period of time. Um, and the reason what I base that suspicion on is that, there, um, that the, the, the first act of procreation had not yet occurred. And Adam and Eve coming together as husband and wife, I'm assuming that there would have been an early conception of an offspring. And that, did, that hadn't happened. When they, when they fall, um, there is still no, no offspring. So my assumption now may just been that, for whatever reason, it was a couple hundred years, um, like uh, Samantha mentioned. So it's the suppositions, but, but it tends to me, it seems like we were probably a relatively short period of time between the creation um, and, the, and the fall. But um, So... What, what I want to do today, we're supposed to be studying Genesis. We are going to study Genesis. I want to talk a little bit before we do about the Pentateuch in general. And then we'll talk about Genesis uh, in, in specific. Uh, the, um, the Pentateuch are those first five books written by Moses. Uh, and we call them, uh, I don't know where the Tuch comes from. But Penta is, I think, Latin for five. So the five books is, is the, the, the name that we give to that. The Law of Moses, those are all kind of uh, similar, uh, similar titles for it. Uh, the, the, it, it. And Genesis, especially when we get there, is, is very, very important. But fundamentally, the, the Pentateuch gives us the origin of Israel. That gets us in the promised land with the nation of Israel and now let's see where where things go um, so that's that's where it, it gets us um, there are um, a lot of things that that come up uh, in the Pentateuch that we'll look at in some of these uh, some of the books of Leviticus and stuff um, we'll talk more about Genesis in a moment the the five books Maybe I'll just give you this overview, and, and then we'll look at each of them in more detail later. Genesis are the beginnings. Um, Exodus is a going out, and you probably can understand why it was titled Exodus. Leviticus has to do with the Levitical or priestly regulations. That's, um, numbers deals with the name, probably from the numbering that was going on there, but it deals with really the 40 years of wilderness wandering. And then Deuteronomy, which is, and if you've read the Bible before, you probably noticed that when you get to Deuteronomy, it's like, I think I've heard these things before. It's because most of them you have. Deuteronomy is, simply means the second giving of the law. And, and as, uh, as Israel stood on the verge of walking into the promised land after the 40 years of wandering and the whole generation died off, Moses restated the law, regave it, um, and, uh, and so there is a second giving of the law um, at that particular point. And, then, and we'll talk more about that uh, as we get uh, to, um, to that particular book. So those are the, the, the first five books. That's how they kind of, kind of fit together. Matter of fact, he did a good job in, in and I've, I've never seen the terminology before, but he used the terminology, uh, what do you call them, foundational books. Um, and, um, yeah, uh, foundational, complementary. Uh, and I thought he had it in here somewhere. But when you talk about chronology, in a sense, what advances us chronologically... Uh, Genesis, um, uh, Exodus, and Numbers advance us chronologically. Deuteronomy does also. Deuteronomy happens in a course of about 30 days. But it's not a significant, um, it's not a significant um, advancement. And so Genesis, Exodus, and Numbers are going to kind of be the timeline for the most part. Leviticus is going to be a lot of information that just kind of gets slid in um, in Exodus and Deuteronomy that gets slid in at the end of Numbers. I thought he had a chart to that extent somewhere. Yeah, there he does. Uh, yeah, that's pretty good. On page 24, right? And, uh, and he also puts Job there as a patriarchal book. We'll get to Job a long time ago. Uh, or not a long time ago. We'll get to Job 
in, you know, at some point. But you can see how he kind of slid Leviticus and Deuteronomy up into those books because they really don't advance us chronologically. I mean, at least not, not, not significantly. Uh, but Genesis is the first book. You know, it is hard to overemphasize the importance of, um, of Genesis. Matter of fact, I've got a couple of quotes from some of those other books that I'll, that I'll, I'll share with you um, uh, that uh, maybe will help us, uh, help us um, uh, you know, put that together. The, uh, in the English division um, of, of the Bible, and I don't think that... Well, he had one of those two. I was going to give you one, but then I, I saw that he had a, a pretty much a, the same thing in his charts on page, yeah, on, uh, on page 16, that middle column, the standard, classific standard English classification, uh, and there's, you have to look at both pages, um, but, uh, but Genesis is... In the big issue of kind of the history book, some people break the Pentateuch off from history, some do not, because that whole area from Genesis to Esther kind of draws the timeline. Um, but, but, it is, but when we say what, what part of the Bible division is Genesis in, you know, to say it's in the history books, to say it's in the law, both of those are, 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 are accurate things to say. Uh, when we talk about and over the course of time, we'll talk a little bit about this. When we talk about genre, can anybody describe what, what literature genre is? Anybody know the term genre? I think it must be French, right? G-E-N-R-E -E with the little accent mark. Come on, some of you know what genre is. I think, is that, is that not how you spell it? Yeah. 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 And 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 in the in the context of of literature, and specifically in the context of biblical literature, um, th this one is going to be prose. Yeah. But when genre is important to us because genre helps us understand, you know, the the author was writing in a certain method, and that's going to help us understand what he says. A simple example is one of the biblical genres is poetry. We'll get to that when we get to Psalms. Poetry as a genre is, has a lot of, uh, of hyperbole. You know, I, I, I cried a bed of tears, all right, and, and it's part of poetry. Nobody says, liar, I know you didn't do it, you know. Um, we say that's how you express emotions. Uh, prose is different. Prose is typically you know, just factual. These things happened. Um, and matter of fact, the question of genre of literature and which genre does the scriptures, do the scriptures have in general? They have, you know, and, and we, would, we would say they have prose, they have poetry, they have wisdom, um, <clears throat> they have, a, they have a apocalyptic genre. That's when there's lots of imagery out there and it looked like tales of dragons with stingers in them and all this type of stuff. So we have different genres, but the book of Genesis actually is a battleground. It's a battleground, huge, huge battleground, always, is even to this very day, continues to be a battleground. And the battle is on the assertion of this issue of genre. Does anybody know what the battle is? The battle is that Genesis 1 through 11, that the genre of 1 through 11, which is really important, is what? Historical. Whether it is historical or, and typically the word is mythological, whether Genesis 1 through 11 is a myth. Okay? It doesn't mean it's, doesn't mean it's not true, but it's not actual. It's not historical. Uh, we have a mythological understanding of Daniel Boone, all right? Um, and and, and, and a lot of this stuff, I'm assuming, I don't, I'm assuming a lot of it is more mythological than it is historical. Um, and is Genesis 1 through 11 mythological or is it historical? Now, 
We take, I take, I hope you take, the, book, the author of your book, take a historical view. We deny emphatically the mythological um, approach to it. And, 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 um, and, and many people, many, all liberal scholars would take a mythological approach to that in many other places. And even some conservatives would kind of say, well, we shouldn't really understand Genesis chapter 1 as, as it's written. It's a creation myth. It's generally kind of descriptive, but it's not giving us a blow by blow. Where prose would say, no, this is a blow by blow that we should understand that way. So, so genre is, is very important and the, the, uh, the decisions that we come to in, in genre. And so um, uh, I, am, I am asserting to you that, uh, that Genesis is, is prose. Uh, prose is the easiest genre in my mind to understand because it, it follows typically with just, you know, our language. Nouns, verbs, objects, say what you mean, mean what you say. All of that is prose. 99.99999% of all of our communication is prose. For a guy like me, it's 100% because... Even to my wife, I don't speak poetic, po poetically, and I, I suspect, Jim, you don't either. No, no, not, not recently. So, so I am always speaking in, in prose, for, for, for you, but you get the point. It's, we're, very, we're very accustomed to it, um, and so it's, a, it's an easy one for us. Um, when we talk about the, the different events in historic uh, particular books, because we got the genre of prose that is, in, that is in the context of history. That's what we're talking about here, because remember, we're going from creation. Genesis will take us from creation to, um, to the 12 tribes ending up in, in Egypt. Okay, Not in captivity yet, but they're in Egypt. So we got a long period of time of, of history. Um, another book of the Bible, you know, for example... Um, uh, Romans. Romans is prose, but it's not a historical prose. Okay, But when we have history and prose put together, we have these little kind of events that take place. And we call these pericopes. Pericopes is just a word for kind of a historic block of information that's meant to go together. The creation account is a pericope. The fall is a pericope. The flood is a pericope. And so we, we, we have these, 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 these accounts that are meant to be read um, as, as a unit. When you get off into something like Romans, then the unit of division is typically the paragraph. And, and the paragraph carries the the thought, the one thought, and you may combine a number of paragraphs to have uh, little thoughts to big thoughts, but thoughts are combined in paragraphs. In history, thoughts are typically combined in, in pericopes, and that's where we are in this book. And we're going to be in this particular idea, prose, in the context of history, from now until Esther. <laughs> so... So we're kind of setting that, setting that, that stage for us. Uh, some of the pericopes, uh, um, well, we already talked, I guess, about, about some of them. So let me, let me go on. Um, the, the, uh, the, Eng, the Hebrew title of this book is Beh Rashit. Beh Rashit. And Beh is a, is an, is a um, preposition that means in. Rashit is the beginning. And so, and as is common in, in many, if not all, of the Hebrew books, the title is really the first couple words, or in a sense, the first phase. The Hebrew title is in the beginning. Now, now our title in English is Genesis, and our title actually has come, it was either from the Latin or the Greek, or maybe a combination of both, I don't know, where in Latin, the, the, the Latin, I think, and I think it was primarily, actually, I think it was primarily from the Greek, they, they used the word beginning, genesis, and we simply transliterated it, Genesis. So, so that's where we get our title. Um, it's a good title. It reflects the idea 
because the book is the beginnings of all things. How many things begin in the book of, well, we know everything begins. What are some specific things that are laid off as, I want you to understand these things began here? What are some things? Earth itself. Very clear. Okay, all of creation. What else? Sin. Sin. Very good. Yeah. What was that? Sin? Yeah, yeah, good. Sin clearly has its beginnings here. What other things are, 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 are and, and here we're kind of thinking, they're theologically significant that the writer, that, that God wants us to know where these things came from. What's that? Light. And, and, and we, so we could take all of creation and, and the stars and all of those things. What else? Okay, man has its beginning there. Okay, as is even we could say marriage. Beginnings of marriage are in, uh, in, in this book. What else? Okay, nation of Israel will come up. Very important beginning. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, we see some of the beginnings of agriculture. We even talk about the beginning of, 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 of instruments. Uh, the beginning of the, the, the dispersion of peoples into different nations and tongues. All is in the book of Genesis. Uh, and so it, and matter of fact, 99% of all this is in the first 11 chapters. And the first 11 chapters kind of says, how did we get to where we are in a very, very broad sweep from God creating a man and a, from, from nothing to having a man and a woman to having nations scattered about with different tongues and living in what appears to be absolute rebellion uh, to the God of the universe. So, so Beginnings is a good title uh, for that. Uh, a couple of data points. Uh, Moses, the author, you'll read that in, in your note, in your book. Uh, and Moses wrote somewhere, and, and when I give you dates, I'm, there, are, there are guys that will spend 25, 25 years figuring out whether it was 1445 or 1443. And I thank the Lord for those guys. But that type of, that, that doesn't really matter. What I, what I like to do with Nate's dates is I want to be able to have a timeline in my mind and I need to know more or less what's a, fun, what's a workable date. So anytime I give you dates, almost any time, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you a good, a good, precise. But if you say, well, I read so-and-so and he actually dates it five years earlier, I am not going to squabble with you on that because it's, it's not functionally... Um, um, in my mind, uh, Germain. Moses wrote the book of Genesis somewhere between 1445 and 1405 B.C. 1445 or 1450, 1410. And all of that is based on the date of the Exodus is around 1445. And they were 40 years in the wilderness. And almost undoubtedly... All of the Pentateuch was written in those 40 years in the wilderness. He didn't write it before the Exodus. Um, he wrote it during that time. And the last book of the Pentateuch, um, um, Deuteronomy, obviously written at that last point. So uh, a lot of, you'll see it in your notes, in your book, a lot of reasons why we believe it to be Moses. It's attributed to Moses throughout, throughout the scriptures. Uh, and, uh, and again, that the, the, the thing in your book about the JEDP theories, um, and you may say, well, whoever thinks of such things? And why is this? I mean, I'm telling you, it is huge. And if you read any type of, of, a, of, a, of a, you know, other than, a, than, than like this, and he even mentions it, but most other surveys, any commentary, any critical commentary or even non-critical commentary, uh, that, that has been so influential since about early 1800s that the denial of kind of the historic understanding of authors, writers, times, um, that it is just all over out there and, 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 and has to be dealt with and has been dealt with. Uh, so the historical, uh, historical setting we've kind of talked about just so I don't, don't, don't miss it again. We are covering from creation to the migration of the 12 tribes to Egypt. Uh, 2,500 years covered in the book of Genesis. 
all of the rest of the Pentateuch um, will only cover 100 years, um, more or less. All of the rest of the Old Testament will only cover 1,100 years. Um, so you get the idea that, um, that there's a, a lot of data, a lot of chronology. Uh, and again, the first, most of it in the first, first 11 chapters. Uh, if you have your Bibles, uh, um, I don't know if he had a map, but go to the maps in the back. Get the kind of the big spanned out world maps, at least the one that, that, that shows... That shows uh, uh, Asia Minor and, um, and um, North Africa and, and um, I don't even know what we call that anymore. Um, and this is, this is kind of the region, the region of, of Genesis, primarily the, the, the Mesopotamia region here, uh, which uh, is Mesopotamia, the region between the two rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates. Uh, and, and I think everybody... Uh, Maybe until recently there was some, some, some assertion that maybe humanity started in Africa, um, some DNA testing or something I heard one, one place. But all of history you know, calls the Mesopotamia, the, the, the cradle of civilization. That's where things began. That is the, the place where the scripture puts, puts the beginning of all things. Matter of fact, we suspect the Garden of Eden was in there. Um, and so, so that's geog geographically, we're talking about this particular region primarily, and it will end, it will end with Abraham, or not end, but Abraham moving into this little region of Canaan, um, uh, uh, Babylon, Babylon, not modern day, <laughs> um, Iraq, yeah, Iraq, um, Iran is kind of all that, that area. Mm -hmm. Good question. Uh, biblically speaking, the, the, the areas, the biblical names that are important um, or, or concepts that are important, again, uh, Mesopotamia, uh, the Promised Land, and Egypt. Those are kind of the three big geographical things that come up in this particular book. Main characters and events. Main characters in the book of Genesis. Main character, lots of characters. It's a historical book. Main characters, who, 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 are, who are the top five or ten? Adam and Eve, certainly. Main character. What's that? I'm, what did you say? Cain and Abel, certainly big characters. Um, yeah, yeah they're, they're second echelon. They're B team, B team characters. <laughs> Moses, I think, will go with the, with, with the main character. Um, um, Noah, clearly, but the one you said before was even bigger. Uh, Abraham. Abraham. Well, I didn't repeat it. Oh, did you? Yeah. Well, you, the, Abraham, clearly a, 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 main, a main player. Um, 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 actually, we said Moses, but Moses doesn't come on the scene till Exodus. Um, but not only Abraham, but once we get in that section, we have Abraham, Jacob. Isaac, Isaac, Jacob, uh, Joseph, Joseph is certainly a very prominent character, but as we see, he's, he's, actually, he's actually probably not a main character. Um, we could throw others uh, in there. Um, you know, one of the characters that's kind of a B character, but he comes out to be a... It, can you think of any B characters who come out to be a really significant character later in the scriptures that he was like, would have never thought about that from reading that? One particular guy in particular. Uh, Esau kind of comes up, yeah. So I think Melchizedek is the one. Yeah. Melchizedek kind of shows up, kind of like a nobody nowhere, and later he's the main argument for the priesthood of Jesus Christ. And so it's like he's not a main character as we read through it, but it's interesting that uh, that he comes up again. Uh, key events, kind of the same. What would they be? Creation, obviously. Fall, key events. Flood, key event. Babel. Mm -hmm. Next in line would be the call of Abraham. Okay, And then maybe the key, I don't know how to say, but at that call of Abraham, the covenant with Abraham is, is fundamental. And matter of fact, we'll drive, we'll drive things all the way into the New Testament um, uh, issues of salvation of the Gentiles by faith. 
Uh, so, so a lot of key. I mean, again, how can you? I mean, there is just so much in this book that drives uh, everything else. Um, that um, it, it, when you when you think about it, it's just mind-boggling. Um, skip over that. Uh, let me give you an at least uh, an. Uh, yeah, I, I want to give you an outline. He has an outline. Uh, in this book, it's pretty good. The, the two big sections that you have to know, you have to know this division. Uh, Genesis 1 through 11, the beginnings of the world, and 12 through 50, the beginnings of Israel. That's a, that's a huge division. Matter of fact, that's not just a Genesis division. That's not just a Pentateuch division. That is an entire corpus of Scripture division. You have Genesis 1 through 11, and then Genesis 12 through Revelation. Really, you, you should think of it in that, in, the, in, that, in that sense. That break there is, is a huge um, transition. Uh, so in, and, and the book of Genesis itself, I think it lays out its own, and you probably have this if you have a study Bible, you probably have a, a, suggested, um, a, a suggested outline of it. Uh, the, 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 the book of Genesis seems to give us its own outline uh, in, a, in a particular phrase. And if you, I don't know if he said it. Uh, if you see it in English, it'll look like this. Toledoth. Uh, and it means, and it's, it's simply, it's, it's like the best sharit, you know, which is a heap. It's just the transliteration of a, um, of a Hebrew word. Toledoth means the generations of. And you'll see this particular phrase, this tag, come up 11 times in the book of Genesis and the generations of. And then there'll be a big section. And then these are the generations of. Boom. And then these are the generations of. Boom. These are the generations of. There's 11 of those, and they lay out the outline of that. In Genesis 1 through 11, the beginnings of the world... Um, it, to subdivide that based on this Toledoth uh, uh, um, kind of section, we have, we have creation in chapters 1 and 2, the fall, 3, 4, and 5. Uh, then we get the history of Adam from, uh, from, from 5 to the first part of 6, the flood, 6 to 9, and then the table of nations um, in 10, 10 through 11. And then chapter 12, we, we get um, the, the history of Abraham. And Abraham will be chapters 12 through 23, um, is Abraham. And Isaac is 24 to 26. And Jacob, a.k.a. what? Israel. Cha name change on that guy. Jacob, Israel, 27 through 50. And your author takes Jacob and he breaks him up into Jacob and Joseph. And that's because Joseph becomes a primary character, but he's not, he is not a stepping stone in the patriarchs. All right? um, you know, because Jacob, Joseph, is simply one of the 12 sons of, or sons of Jacob. Okay, and so uh, he's really not, uh, I, I think, to think of this last section, Jacob, you know, all of it being about Jacob. Interesting thing that you, sh that you note kind of, kind of right away here when you just look at space given to it. I don't know if you ever noticed it before. Isaac doesn't get much coverage, doesn't get much press. He stands between Abraham and Jacob as the father of the nation. Um, and, you know, Probably has nothing to do with whether or not he was important, other than this is the call of the nation. This is the establishment of the nation. This is where it exists. Israel, Jacob renamed Israel, what we, you know, the promised people and his, and his 12 sons. And so, so that's kind of an outline of it. Now, I told you that there's a major break here. Before this, we have the the, uh, the beginnings of history, the beginnings of the nations, whatever. Um, uh, 
and that's 1 through 11, and then we pick up in 12. Let me read you from uh, the book that I was going to have you read, and I told you, and this is just one of the gold mine passages of there that you're not going to get because you're not reading it. Um, and I want to, it's, it's a little bit, it's a little bit uh, extended, so bear with me. But, uh, but the way he, he, he creates this, uh, this picture is, is better than I can do. Uh, so let me read you what he says about this, this division between this and this, this particular point in the Bible, this, this, cat, this, this, this dividing line here. Uh, he says the purpose um, of this narrative is, I'm picking up in the middle, but I think you'll get it. The purpose of this narrative is set forth by the fact that it does not stand alone. The whole story is given special historical and theological meaning by the relationship it sustains to its preface. Um, he's, he's referring here to this narrative and that it, 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 it has special historical and theological relationship as it relates to its preface, the primeval prologue, he calls it. Not concerned with the particularisms of promise and election, central to Genesis 12 through 35, 12 through 34, the focus of the concern of Genesis 1 through 11 is universal. It goes back to the ultimate origins, to creation of all things, especially man and woman, then sets forth in theological terms how man and woman came to be the way they have been since ancient times, at war with themselves, alienated and separated from God and their fellows in a broken, disorderly world with nation pitted against nation, social element against social element, the individual against the individual. The author paints this dark picture by tracing the origin and rise of sin from the disobedience of the first man and woman in the Garden of Eden through fat fratricide of Cain, the murderous vengeance expressed in Lamech's boastful song, the general corruption of mankind heinous enough to warrant the flood, to the dissolution of mankind, mankind's primal unity in which they are scattered into the disorder of the world, expressed in the story of the Tower of Babel. The author of Genesis 1-11 through intended by the whole plan of the primeval history to pose in all severity at its end the question of God's future relationship to this scattered, broken, and alienated humanity. Is, God patience, is God's patience endurance is God's patient endurance exhausted? Has he dismissed the nations in wrath forever? Only in light of this introduction can one understand the significance and meaning of the election and blessing of Abraham. Immediately following the geological separation, geological genealogy, genealogy separating the primeval and patriarchal prologue, which stands like a rubric at the beginning of patriarchal history. The contrast then between Genesis 1 and 11 and the particularistic history of promise, election, deliverance, everything after Genesis 1 through 11, um, and covenant that follows is dramatic and striking. The latter is deliberately and consciously set forth as the answer to the former. In God's special dealing with Abraham and his descendants lies the answer to the anguish of the whole human family. Now, I don't know if you got that as well as you should have got it if you had read it, but, but I hope, I hope you, you, you get the point that, that this leaves us standing on the edge of a precipice wondering, maybe this is it. Maybe God's done. Maybe there's nothing left. Um, and then we turn over into a new page and we start seeing this plan of redemption that God has worked out. Matter of fact, if you, if you think about it, graphically speaking, Genesis 1 through 11 kind of does this. It looks like this, everything's getting bigger and bigger. We're going from one man to a family to now whole generations. And, and, and the... The, the scope of things is just getting larger and larger and larger. And then at Genesis 12, he stops 
and just focuses in on a point. And the, the point is Abraham. And, and then he'll continue on, and on, that, on that, particular, that particular point. And matter of fact, you can even make the argument that this point then narrows down to, I don't know how to do that with a point, but the point narrows down to Jesus Christ. So it is a, it's, it is a major, 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 major division uh, that takes, takes place here. Okay, questions, comments at this point uh, before we, 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 we finish up our time just with maybe a survey of chapters. Um, questions, comments, thoughts, ideas, dialogue, Yeah, you're t and you're talking about the, the readings in the in the right. book, and, yeah. and he, and, and he did he he took he did a little bit more theology with Genesis than I think he's going to do with the other books, but but he, he did some good work there on the covenants, the uh, the um, the um, what do we call it the um, unilateral nature of the of the uh, Abrahamic covenant. Uh, that it was by God alone, um, not a not a both parties have to fulfill, um, and right. so he did did a lot with that. Mm -hmm. Good. Other thoughts, ideas, questions on Genesis? It's a big I, book. I, I just find it interesting with Abraham specifically what he was called, but it doesn't. The Bible doesn't mention anything special about. Yeah. Him. And he does it. Yeah. He did. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know that I would go that direction. Um, uh, the uh, when we read about about Abraham's pre pre call, we, we know him to be a polytheist, um, and and God he does obey, um, but I don't know that we should assume that that obedience is why God chose Abraham. The issue of choosing, which will become central. Matter of fact, even when he tells us, when he tells Israel, I didn't choose you guys because of anything in you. I didn't choose you because you were a big nation, strong nation. Matter of fact, I chose you for all the reasons that nobody, nobody would choose you. And so the issue of choice, of God's working, is, it's, and it seems from beginning with Abraham, is it is, a, it is regardless of, of the that God is extending grace, He's not finding man worthy of it. You know, if we want to say, you know, and, and I think that's part of the point of what the book was saying. We get to this precipice, and probably if most of us were God, we'd say, "Not worth messing with this group." All right, let's just walk on and start over. And instead, God begins a process of of redemption through an unlikely character from an unlikely place who really is only asked to get up and walk away. And, and, and he does, and we're going to see lots of flaws in, in, in his character. So he becomes a, I, I don't, I don't I, you know, I, I guess I, we, we want to emphasize the role of faith, because that's what he exercised, and, and, um, but we want to not... Um, um, not overemphasize the, the value of Abraham as God, why God began with him. I think God wants us to throw up our hands and say, well, we don't know. Doesn't seem to make sense. Not sure I would have done it that way. But nonetheless, it is, you know, as 
as we, you know, as we'll see later with Jacob and Esau, it's by choice that uh, that God chooses. So, so I, yeah, I, 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 I don't. Yeah, I do. I do think, like, I, I agree. I think Trevor, right? um, mm-hmm. There's nothing special about him from what I've heard. Yeah. And like, he wasn't. I think God does it in a lot of cases. You see that throughout the Bible. Mm-hmm. You see yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, go ahead. Just, I, I would say that because that's how I kind of read it. I mean, I, I could be wrong. Yeah. But also, like Paul too. Like he, he was, he was definitely not a Christian, and then the way it was, he had his faith. And and the what now? Yeah, his faith when he, Jesus came down and did what he did. To and and yeah, and, and 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 yeah. So so faith is fundamental, and that that'll be a key that that Abraham will take throughout the entire. That faith is the means of redemption with God. By faith, righteousness is, is credited. And so that is a, a message that will be bullhorned um, where a lot of people, and, and hopefully none, none, none of us, some people, if you ask them, they think that somehow in the Old Testament you're saved by obeying the law, in the New Testament you're saved by believing in Jesus. Those are not things you should believe. No one was ever saved by obeying the law. Everyone was always saved through the exercise of faith in the promise, the promise of God. Um, and, uh, and so faith is absolutely, um, absolutely fundamental. Some people, and I think it was in your reading, you know, there's this idea that the, the covenant with Abraham, because the covenant is made in 12, the exercise of faith in Abraham comes, I think, in 15. So, so the covenant predated the exercise in faith. He is commanded to go, and, and, and I think you saw it in your reading, hopefully you saw it in your reading, that um, um, there is the question, was the going a contingency? If you go, then I will exercise the covenant, or I'm going to exercise the covenant because it's unilateral, and, and the going was not related to God's placing himself under obligation to make a great nation of him. And, and as you saw, that was kind of a toss-up on, on, where, on where people went. Yeah, and that, so at, 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 yeah, at most, that's, and, and clearly from that point on, we would say it was a unilateral covenant. God says, I'm going to do these things uh, whether, whether you obey me or not. And, and, uh, and, and the Abrahamic covenant and uh, the, uh, the Davidic covenant, the new covenant, uh, he uses the term the Palestinian covenant, which not everybody uses. Um, but all of those, and the only one that was different was the Mosaic covenant. So, um, right, we had, wasn't that in this book? We had those readings of covenants? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so covenants, and, and kind of a different subject, but I don't want to forget this. Covenants are very important. But don't make the mistake of, of associating these covenants, the Abrahamic, the Mosaic, the Davidic, with, with what we know of today as covenant theology. And some of you may or may not know what I'm talking about. Um, but covenant theology, which is uh, sometimes juxtaposed against uh, dispensational theology... Uh, covenant theology is, is not referring to those covenants. It's not referring to the Davidic, the Mosaic, any of those. Uh, and so it's not, that's, that's not what they're, what they're referring to. They're actually referring to uh, two and or three, depending on who you talk to, covenants that God made with himself in eternity past that aren't recorded in, in the scripture. So, um, so some of you may be covenant, you may uh, adhere to covenant theology, um, I, I don't, I'm a dispensationalist, um, but, but that is not these covenants that we're talking about. These are different covenants. I just yeah. want to make a comment that Paul Benoit actually has a book on end times prophecy. He very, very specifically goes into all the covenants. Does he? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think he even made that comment here that, that you, you need to understand the Abrahamic covenant. If you don't understand the Abrahamic covenant, you won't understand the flow of the scriptures because that is a fundamental kind of, 
uh, event going on. And I think he's correct that understanding the Abrahamic covenant is, 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 is key. Um, well, let's, let's, I don't know, we'll get there in a minute. Any other questions before we just do a quick survey over books, over chapters? Uh, let's just, he did that in his book a little bit, um, and so I, I, I won't repeat that. I'm just going to go over a, um, a few of the notes that I have, and we can dialogue on any of them. So as we go over these, uh, if, you have, uh, if you have thoughts, uh, bring it up. Uh, again, Genesis 1, uh, creation, uh, you know, um, well, uh, Genesis 2, the Garden of Eden and perfection, and probably just a second creative account, a more detailed one. If you're saying, well, when did he, when did he create woman? Was it after the seventh day? Because he says he created man of the sixth, and then there was the seventh, and then he, goes, then he talks about the woman coming along the line. When did she come about? Genesis 2 should be understood as, have, as, as a restatement of, of the sixth day of creation, just in more detail. Genesis 1 has given us just kind of the, the overview. Genesis 2 then steps back and talks about uh, the actual creation in more detail of man, particularly um, of the woman. In, uh, in Genesis 1, you know, even in, uh, on the sixth day we have, and he created them in the image of God, male and female, he created them. So we have plenty of allusions to the creation of, of, of Eve in Genesis 1, um, not to think that it is a later chronological event. Uh, then Genesis 3, we know big, big, big issue, the fall, the curse, the expulsion. Matter of fact, we, we talked about a lot of things about the Bible. And, and if you again took and put your finger in Genesis chapter 3, or right before Genesis chapter 3, I can't even get there. It's, you know, it's like, you know, here is, here is what God, yeah, for me it's that. You know, this was, this was God's intent, okay, Genesis Three interrupts it. All of this fixes this, and Revelation chapter twenty-two gets back to this, and that's a pretty Im impressive graphic. So this is just explains how God worked out the, the, the you know the the brokenness that happened in. Um, in Genesis chapter 3. Uh, 4 and 5, uh, and, and, you know, I, I would call it the imputation of the fall to humanity. Um, that Adam and Eve fell, they passed it on to their children, who pass it on to their children, and their children, and their children, and men just become so bad uh, that we kind of get to this climax in chapters six, seven, eight, and nine, where the sons of God uh, cohabitate with the daughters of men, and God sends a flood. There's often lots of questions. As a matter of fact, we're in, we're in Second Peter in the morning service, and Second Peter and Jude kind of get into some of these things, and lots of people wonder: Is this? Is this? Does sons of God mean angels? Do angels cohabitate with men and create some? offspring, half man, half God. Um, um, and my assertion to that is no, you should not understand it that way. Uh, sons of God is, um, is, is probably a term used for, for there were you know, certain, certain people that were attempting to follow the Lord, certain people that clearly like the, the, the sons of, of, uh, of, of Cain, who were just, there, there, there was really wicked and there was somebody at least tempting, but the intermarriage ruined all that. The reason I don't think, and, and I know that, and if you don't, if you don't like that explanation, you're fine. I, this, is, this, is a, this is an area where, you know, we just don't know. For me, the reason I don't think he can be referring to angels is that, is, is because angels are not, Angels are not physical beings. Angels are spirit beings. Um, to, 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 what's that? Well, angels, angels seem to have a degree of freedom to operate as God allows it, same as we have freedom. Um, but, but I think this, you know, to, for lack of a better term, angels don't have the plumbing to procreate. They don't have it. Procreation takes a, a physical egg and a physical sperm to unite 
in order to create a child. There is no such thing as a spiritual, angelic ability to do that. Right? And so I'm trying not to be graphic, but, but just to let you know, that it's a different kind of creature. They, they, they can't procreate. They don't, they don't procreate. So I think to think that this is angels is probably far-fetched, yeah. Could, I don't really believe in that either. Yeah. I just, I kind of look at it just but at like, least that's closer to the truth. Yeah, that, yeah so feasibly. People try to argue that. Like, yeah. Real pastors are so yeah. Really sad. Right? Yeah. I don't think that's really. I think it's the case of. I remember I was talking to my wife about it. It was really confusing when you read some of this stuff. And it seems like maybe it's just people that are trying to follow God and then maybe these women that were kind of rebellious and really out there. And, then, you know, and, that's, and we know that's the, that's the cause of all trouble, is men trying to follow God and women, women leading them astray. I mean, we already, that fits with reality, so it's, it's good theology. So, yeah. <laughs> it did all start with Eve, right? Yeah, I mean, come on. Maybe they didn't want to procreate, they just wanted to do the act with it. No difference. Um, they, they, it's, yeah, I don't... That, you can't, you don't have a physical, there's, there's no physical being. It's a spirit being. Um, um, our souls do not procreate. It takes physical flesh and blood um, to, to procreate. So. And, and that, I, I don't remember exactly, but there's some weird word about the offspring. Was it becomes the Nephim, the giants of old. And, the giants of old, yeah. and that's kind of like your, and, and so. And there's, there's actually other references in the scripture. Right? I mean, it's, it's for an actual more detailed study, not a survey, um, of where the Nephi'im are, 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 are talked about as just a very tall group of people that are still around even after the flood. Because some of the idea is that because you had this half-breed, half-angel, half-man, God sent the flood to destroy this race of people, and then we're back to just people again. Um, again, I don't think you should understand that. But many people do, and many, um, many very sound people do. Because, you know, it kind of has that verbiage, but it doesn't seem to fit with, and, and the verbiage is, is just generic enough. Sons of God, is that, that is not al- does, does not always mean angels. Sometimes it does, but it doesn't always. So, um, so we have the flood. Uh, and then right after the flood, things go south again. Uh, and then we have the origins of the nations. And again, a lot of data, a lot of time covered real quickly. The origins of the nations culminate in the Tower of Babel. And then the, the scattering of humanity, the confusing of, uh, of language. Um, a matter of fact, uh, you know, um, uh, probably uh, the confusion of language, an act of cursing or grace of God. What is it? The confusing of language at Babel, was it God's judgment or God's grace? I think it's more grace than judgment, okay? More, more grace than, than judgment. That, yeah, that, yeah. And, and it's pretty easy to see that in any area that, that, you, can, that you can combine your intellects and that you can do good things by combining your intellect, but fallen humanity always seems to have evil outpace good in that. I mean, and, and, and the, the, the examples are, are plethora. You know, we combined our intellect and, and create, create television. And there's some great things that you can do with television. But the evil just seems to outpace the good. Um, or with internet, there's some great things, but the evil outpaces the good. With the medical field, we do some great things combining our intellect and medical, and we do some really wicked, evil things, and it seems to out, outpace the good. So I, I, I think, it, I think it, God is trying to keep us, if he gave us the ability to all work together, we would probably self-destruct before before the proper time. We're going to self-destruct anyways. The world is going to self-destruct. But, um, but I think he's retarding that self-destruction with the confusion of language. It's an opinion.
Uh, then again, big issue, call of, call of Abraham. Let's go there. Yeah, we can read it real quick. If, if we're saying this is a fundamental divide, we better at least let our eyes go over the passage. Uh, Genesis 12, 1. The Lord said to Abraham, Go forth from your country, from your relatives, from your father's house, to the land which I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so you shall, and, and, and so you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Here was one area where I thought maybe the author didn't, didn't quite do a good enough job. Um, and, uh, and I forget how he, how he listed out kind of the fundamental aspects of, of the Abrahamic covenant. And, but I think you should understand the fundamental aspects of the Abraham covenant as threefold. Uh, and, uh, and, and he listed some of these, but kind of combined others. Uh, that, that Abraham was promised in, in verse 1, he was promised a land. Um, and that is the land of, of, of Canaan, the, the land that you know, we're still fighting over for, for Israel. And are they going to have it or are they not going to have it? Um, but that was, seems to be an eternally promised uh, to, to Abraham and to his descendants. Um, in verse 2 he says, I will make you a great nation. That clearly is offspring. He promised him a great offspring. A land, um, which we would call a, a kingdom, and, and this the author did a good job on. And the last one is in verse 3 when he says, In you all the families of the earth shall be blessed, that there is this idea of through you, all of the, everybody else, that's not you, will also be blessed, and this is the promise of the Messiah. Uh, and, and the New Testament will go back to this particular passage and that particular aspect of it, um, and, and quote that. So, so a land, um, uh, a people, um, and, and the Messiah are kind of the three big aspects of the, uh, the promise of, of, of Abraham. The author did do a good job as he tied in the Davidic covenant. Uh, and he told you the Palestinian covenant was the giving of the land. Um, the Davidic covenant, the, the, the giving of the Messiah and, and the kingdom, uh, the new covenant. And matter of fact, his, his little chart on covenant was, was actually, you know, if, if you looked at it and you saw this is cool and you didn't trace, you know, I, I, you know, I was an engineer in college and so I liked flow charts. Um, if you don't trace the arrows and the arrows are done accurately, they're not just arrows. Uh, even what, what is connected to what and what is not connected to what um, is, um, is he's done a good job um, in, in reflecting, uh, reflecting the centrality of the Abrahamic covenant and the other covenants as they work with it and where they're pointing, where they, uh, where they go. Um, in matter of fact, um, I thought I put some notes down. Where did I do that? Uh, huh. Somewhere, somewhere, somewhere. And I'm, you know, I can't remember if it's for this class or somewhere else. Um, but when he talks about the fact that, um, the, that the, uh, the Mosaic covenant is terminal, okay, it wasn't an, an eternal covenant, a universal covenant. You know, that fits in with a lot of the passages of Jesus. I didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. That Christ is the end of the law. That there was a, a, a huge break at the cross with the Mosaic Code. And, and this becomes a real big interpretive error, or not error, but interpretive issue of how do we relate to the Mosaic Code after it has been, it has been fulfilled. And, and, and we can talk about that another time. Maybe we'll talk about it when we get to um, Exodus and, and see the Mosaic Code given. Um, but there's a lot of differences of pe how people deal with that. Abraham and Lot and Melchizedek, we talked about him already, come up in chapter 13 and 14. Then we have the, uh, the, uh, the restatement of the Abrahamic covenant in verse 15, also very important passage. Um, that one where Abraham's faith is, is, is you know, it's credited to him as righteousness. Um, and so uh, faith becomes central in chapter 15. Hagar and Ishmael, 
uh, come up in chapter 16 and, uh, and Ishmael being you know, the, the father of the Arabs. Uh, chapter 17, the, the uh, circumcision of the promised son Isaac. Uh, the uh, chapters 18 and 19, Sodom and Gomorrah. And Lot, and he, I think he had a chart in there about the relationships of Abraham uh, to Lot and to Sarah. That was also well done. I can't remember where it, uh, where it came 47. up. 47. That was also well done. And, uh, and if you look at that precisely, you'll, you'll see he's done a, a good job with that. One of the things I didn't mention, and maybe you've done this or, or maybe you haven't, when you look at the genealogies and, and you get back, we should have talked about this back when we were at the flood. What is that? Genesis 7 is the flood. But if you look at from Adam to, uh, um, uh, to Seth, to whoever was after them, all the generations, and he lived 120 years and beget other sons and daughters, and da, 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 you know that genealogies. And, I, and don't, don't quote me on this, I can't remember exactly, um, but, um, but when, if, if you work out the numbers as they're listed there, when Noah is, 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 is on the scene, um, that how did that work again? Ah, I should have looked it up before I looked. But basically, this Noah's father or grandfather, one of the two, would have known a Adam personally. Okay? The age of Adam took him all the way down to where he just dies not long before Noah's on the scene. So when you think about the oral transmission of accounts, you know, you've got people that, you've got lots of generations of people who were around way up until, way up until the flood. Um, so uh, something worth looking at if you have an interest in that. Uh, chapter 20, Abraham lies to King Abimelech about his uh, wife. Chapter 21, Isaac is born. Ishmael is sent away. Chapter 22, the offering of Isaac. And here's another thing that the author mentioned uh, that Isaac offered on Mount Moriah, the same place that, that Christ would be crucified on, or his son would be offered. I don't know where he's getting that. Um, uh, the uh, Golgotha. I, I don't know of any. I don't know of anybody that places Moriah at Golgotha. Um, Moriah, from every, although my study is placed on the Temple Mount, uh, and not on Golgotha. So Mount Moriah was where is where later they'll, uh, David will offer his sacrifice. Um, 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 to, um, uh, to stop the plague, um, and they'll build the temple. So, so that's something, I don't, I don't know where he got, where he, what, he, what he said. But. Um, death of Sarah, uh, chapter 23, chapter 24, the marriage of Isaac to Rebekah, uh, chapter 25, the death of Abraham, Jacob and Esau are born. God reaffirms in chapter 26 the covenant with Isaac. Uh, chapter 27, Jacob steals the blessing. Uh, and chapter 28, he goes to Padam Aram, which is, if you can envision Israel in your mind, it's kind of back up uh, in the area of Mesopotamia um, is, is where he goes. Uh, 29 and 30, Jacob's marriage, his sons, uh, 31 and 32 and 33, they return to the promised land. Uh, 34 through 36, the death of Isaac, the death of Rachel. Chapter 37, Joseph becomes prominent, sold into slavery. It's an interesting section, chapter 38. You almost have to kind of wonder why it's there. Judah and Tamar in the account of Judah, Judah's um, um, or, or, um, adultery with Tamar. Uh, in chapters 39 through 40, Joseph in Egyptian prisons. 42 through 45, Joseph over Egypt in, in the second in command, his brother's visit. 46 and 47, Jacob and his sons migrate to Egypt. 48 and 49, Jacob blesses his sons. Chapter 50, Jacob dies. They bury him in the same cave. And his wife and Israel is in the promised land. 
not in the promised land. Israel is in Egypt waiting out the, um, um, the, the famine. And uh, Joseph is in, is, in, uh, is in command. And from Genesis, Genesis closing to the opening of Exodus will transpire a number of hundred years. And we'll start in Exodus. And there was, you know, uh, a king arose that didn't know Joseph. So takes us, you know, to, the, um, uh, to Egypt. A couple of other things just to keep in mind. Uh, 270 quotes and allusions. Allusions means it's not verbatim, but it's clearly referencing. 270 quotes and allusions of Genesis in the New Testament alone. Just in the New Testament. That's a lot. Um, tells us how fundamental, how, how much it's, it's important for us. Uh, a couple of other things uh, really, really important that come up in Genesis. The, the, uh, the idea that the Messiah will be born of woman comes up in Genesis. Genesis 3.15. Your seed will, will, will uh, you know, what's, what's it say? Your seed will be at enmity with his seed. You will crush his head. He will strike you on the foot. On the foot. So the Messiah will, will, will be of, of woman. Uh, and then the issue of Melchizedek we talked about. So that's kind of a, a flyover of Genesis. Uh, last minute questions, comments, dialogue. Oh. Go, just a second. Go ahead, Rachel. Genesis 3.15. I think it's, I, I, I think we're pretty sure it was Hebrew. I, I, I got to remember back, but yeah. Yeah, I think, I think Hebrew was, was the tongue at that particular time. Mm -hmm. yep. mm -hmm. Heber was the, I think, the, the origin of the Hebrews or yeah. so on. But mm -hmm. any other parting thoughts, comments? Um, just one more yeah. thing I thought of. I remember last time you spoke about 4,000 BC. Yeah. Could that be longer? Is that really something people have done a lot of? Yeah, can that, can that be longer? Clearly, clearly could be. Um, if Unger, I think, was Bishop Unger. I can't remember what his name was. I don't know why he was called Bishop. Um, but he did the backdating of all the genealogies. Comes up with 404 B.C. Um, for, for creation, if the genealogies are, are, are intact. 4004 B.C. Um, was, the, was the date of creation, if the genealogies are, are seamless. Um, it is... It is not heretical to assume that the genealogies may have skipped from father to um, so and so I, I, and I think what, what you can do with all of that is um, you can a couple of interesting things if you look at Hebrew dating of the world it's closer to that um, and they, they kind of date I forget I, th I thought they dated from creation I forget I forget what year they put us in but it's not far off from that but even if you if you want to argue for for gaps in the genealogies um, and you know you you can you can you can argue for we only have half of them there. It's twice as long as it tells us. You're still back at 8,000 BC. Um, three times as long. We only have a spattering of them. You get back to 12 uh, to get to millions and billions of years. You have to you have to get to mythology because there's just no 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 way to do that. One of the other things that we often don't think about, and but this is interesting when you think about age of the earth, what is the actual age? And I know by saying these things you go against all scientific whatever, whatever. I mean, I understand that, but I've, but I, you know, I, I mean, man is depraved, his mind too. When you look at the history of writing, um, and, and even the, the um, oh, what's the major Babylonian, um, document that is much like the, the suzerain treaty, um, the Hammurabi Code, the Hammurabi Code, uh, which is just ab absolutely intense, not intense, it's absolutely good law code. Um, and, um, and I think we go back to three or 4,000, um, 3,000 3, BC. Um, and and, and so you have very, 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 very good law code at 3000 BC, and they would have you to believe that writing just started about 4000. 
And that just doesn't make sense. That you go, that it takes man millions and millions of years. In other words, the, the, the history of writing kind of just blows on the scene out of nowhere. And that doesn't seem like an evolutionary, you would think it to be much slower. So I think that's, that, I think that, that's an additional argument, I think, for a young earth. So were you going to say something? Oh, no. 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 Yeah, okay. Yeah. So am I. I'm always scratching my... So, all right, well, let's close in a word of prayer. Uh, Father, we do thank you for our time to kind of think through this, blow over it, um, and uh, lots, of, lots of stuff here, and, and hopefully much of it is a review for us, and, and uh, the things that are new, Father, I, I, help you, I pray that you would help each of us to, uh, to find a place to hang them in our minds, these, these new things, so that we can recall them uh, when necessary as we, as we seek to not read your word, not just Genesis, but the, but the rest of your word, which which in many cases hinges on this book. And so we, uh, we desire to recall these things, Father, and to, uh, to improve our knowledge of, of you through your word. And these things we pray in Christ's name. Amen.